And Houston, this is Station. I'm ready for the event. University of Illinois, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Philip Dubel, University of Illinois. How do you hear me? And University of Illinois at Fighting Illini, I hear you loud and clear, and I'm ready to answer some questions. All right, fantastic. <laughs> uh, Mike, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, we have a very limited time, so we've asked a student to put together a few questions. And uh, without further delay, let's, let's get started. Hello, Mike. My name is Bentik. That sounds I'm a great. Junior, and my question is, from your experience, what aspect of human travel still needs better solutions? And what should the focus be for college students like us to solve for future astronauts and space tourists? Yeah, that's actually a great question, and uh, it's a tough one to answer as well. Uh, because as we look at what we're doing now in low Earth orbit, a lot of the technologies are there, as you can see, but just by the operation of, of the space station. But as we look at uh, going further, going beyond low Earth orbit onto an asteroid or back to the moon or even to Mars, we need to start, I think, looking at how we can be a little more autonomous in our operations up here. We have a fantastic ground team that is a part of running the space station on a day-to-day -day basis, and we need them, and, and it wouldn't work without them. But if we're looking at going further out into, uh, into the universe, then we need to be able to do that somewhat independently. And so as you start to look at all of the technologies, I think that's one area that we need to focus on is, is being able to uh, have them be a little more autonomous, a little more reliable, and, uh, and a crew on board being able to operate them without as much help from the ground. Thanks. Uh, hey, Mike. I'm Michael Miller. I'm a sophomore here. Um, can you tell us one thing about the space station that none of us could learn from anywhere else except from somebody who's actually living there? Yeah, I actually love that question, and and uh, it's a it's a pretty tough question to answer. Uh, but there was something that I was struck with when probably the first day that I was up here, and that is that the, the station is even more amazing than I ever thought it was going to be. And in some sense, I, I feel like it's alive. I mean, there's, there's just this constant, uh, there's this constant noise. It has its own, uh, I don't know, you just hear it every day when you're up here, and it's, a good, it's, it's good to hear that. It's good sounds, and, and you just feel like uh, the station is, is alive, and, and you're getting this opportunity to this special opportunity to be a part of it. And, and so I think that's something that even with all the simulators we have on the ground that look exactly like this, until you're up here and you feel that and you hear it and, and you sense it, uh, that's probably something that you'll, you'll never get unless you're here. Hey, Mike. Uh, thanks for talking to us today. I'm Dane Rogers. I'm a senior here. Uh, my question, uh, the ISS serves as an excellent place to do scientific research. What experiments are you, is the station working on right now, and uh, what would you like to see as far as scientific experiments in the coming years? Yeah, that's, uh, that's another great question, and there's a, there's a ton of science going on up here. In fact, during our increment, we expect to see around 200 experiments that are going to be performed. And they range from experiments that astronauts are not as involved in. So, for example, there's the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, which is looking for the origins of the universe. And our involvement as astronauts in that is to simply keep the station running and, and providing the power and the data and the communication links that that, that payload, that experiment needs to, to perform. Other experiments that are going on, um, the capillary flow experiments. So it's, it's looking at how fluids behave in microgravity and how they'll move along surfaces in different ways that you don't see down on Earth. And so there's a lot of potential there for, uh, for future space flight um, in, in moving fluids around without necessarily or separating them from, from gases without necessarily needing pumps. And then there's the experiments that we're very involved in because we're the guinea pigs. And so, for example, one of the things we always have to contend with is, is um, uh, bone loss and muscle loss. And so one of them is a pro-K where we're looking at the relationship between protein and potassium and how that may impact our bone loss. And so those are all very important. Um, I think uh, you, 
in the future you're just going to see a continuation of those types of experiments that are looking at both what we need for future space exploration and then also things that uh, are very beneficial for life on Earth. Thanks, Mike. My name is Jenny Roderick, and I'm a super senior. Uh, my question is, what scientific and engineering principles are most important to know while working and living aboard the space station? Yeah, I think I was a super senior, too, at one point in time. Um, you know, there's uh, the, the thing about life up here is you need it all. You have to kind of be a jack of all trades. You have to have a lot of uh, not just book knowledge, uh, engineering principles and things like that, but you also have a lot, need to have a lot of hands-on experience. You need to be able to crank the wrench. In fact, uh, today I spent uh, time repairing our uh, carbon dioxide removal assembly and also replacing a uh, CCAA, which is a, uh, an airflow, uh, what we use for our, our conditioning of the air up here. And, you know, so there you're doing just kind of some maintenance type work. And, and then when you're doing those, like that capillary flow experiment that I talked about, well, then some of that uh, engineering and physics principles need to, need to come in. So you need to be a jack of all trades. And I think that's as important as anything. Thanks, Mike. I'm Sarah Barrett. I'm a senior here. What is your favorite thing to do in space? Well, that's an easy one for me. My favorite thing uh, in space is just to float. And I don't know many places that you can do this. I mean, that's a lot of fun. You, uh, I don't know, it doesn't get old even just in the middle of your work day as you get to float around from one module to another. It, it's, it's just fun. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. It's an experience that I've never had before. Uh, hey, Mike, I'm Mustafa Mukadam. Uh, I'm studying Masters in Aerospace Engineering. My question is, how frequently do you lose the sense of time when you're not looking at clocks, since you don't see the sun rise and fall and it's constantly dark outside? Does that have any psychologically depressing effects on the daily life of an astronaut? Yeah, you know, that's an interesting question because, uh, unfortunately, we're, we're always looking at the clock up here. We have a very tight schedule every day. And uh, so, and there's this in that schedule. There's this little red line that just constantly goes across. That's telling you what time it is. And as you look at your tasks, you know whether you're ahead or you're behind. And we kind of live by that. And so uh, our schedule up here is uh, it's down to five minute increments. And so um, you never kind of lose that sense of time because you're always aware that uh, I've got tasks to do or something like that. And and so you don't get that sense. And when you're inside and you're not looking out, when you're not looking outside at the uh, at the sun rises and sets, you don't get that sense of uh, 16 sunrises and sets every day. So it's really um, you know it's it we don't lose track of time too often up here. Hey Mike, I'm Nick Holden. I'm a sophomore. How will astronauts prepare for flights to the station in the future on spacecraft built by commercial companies? Yeah, so a lot of the training is going to be very similar to what we do now. In fact, um, what you're going to find the space station side of the house, that training is not going to be any different. And we, and we do that training both at uh, Houston, in Japan, in Europe, and also in Russia. And, and that's going to still have to happen no matter what vehicle you're coming up on. The big difference, of course, is going to be if we're riding up on a U.S. commercial vehicle, well, then that training um, is going to likely occur all in the U.S. and whether that's in Houston or where the commercial vendors are is probably still to be determined. But what that means for for future astronauts is you're not going to have to travel quite as much. I spent over two and a half year training program. I spent uh, probably about a year to a year and a half of that away from home and family, and so I think that'll make a big difference. All right, I think we got the, the sign that we have to stop it. <laughs> so I really thank you so much for taking the time to do this, considering how busy your schedule is, and, uh, and, and, and good luck for the next five months. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's an absolute pleasure to, uh, to talk to you guys. I wish we could do this more. In fact, um, I may try, uh, Professor, I may try and get in touch with you a little bit because I know there was more questions, and I'd love to be able to answer them. And so uh, I think if your email is out there, I'll, I'll try and get a hold of you, and, and uh, maybe we can continue the conversation via that, that route. All right. That'd be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. 
station. This is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. Thank you, University of Illinois. Station, please stand by while we reconfigure video and audio communications.